Okay, it's the end of the session. I'm here with, uh, this is Sam. Sit. This is Jack. And this is their roadmap to success. Um, now, they are siblings, and uh, although you can have siblings together, there is something called sibling rivalry, and it happens for humans, it happens for dogs. And I think him being the bigger dog, he kind of dominates Jack a little bit. Um, I just watched a couple of videos of uh, a, a fight. I wouldn't say necessarily as a fight. It looked like play that got a little bit too spirited. So one of the things I recommend the Guardian do is help them practice. Hey, thank you, buddy. I uh, help them practice um, play, interrupting play time. Now, if, if we're letting them play and they go, I like to say dogs have 10 levels of energy. 10 is as crazy as seeing the dog. One is basically this. And so if they are, are, are you know, going to level one, two, three, and I stop at level three, it's gonna be a lot easier for them to stop at three than if I let them go to eight. It's gonna take longer for them to settle down. So one of the things I like the guardian to do is when, they, when the play starts getting spirited, go out there, have some treats, touch their nose with the treats, ask them to sit, ask them to lay down, give them a couple treats for doing these things and keep them on either side of you and help them focus on you. Uh, there's focus at, uh, uh, exercise is one of the ones that I do a lot. I have on my website, you can search for it. You go to dogonproblems.com, uh, click on dog training tips. There's a search box on the right side, just type in focus exercise. I've done it with hundreds of dogs, probably hundreds of videos of you doing it. Um, and then teaching them to focus or uh, lay down or whatever it is. So you're interrupting that play before it gets too crazy and helping them settle themselves down to like level two or level one energy. And when they get down to this, then you let them resume the play. So you're kind of calibrating how high and how intense the play can go. Just like us, the higher and more intense it is, like I said, the harder it's, and longer it's gonna to take to separate. So um, now they, being siblings, this is something that is more common with siblings because they're more used to each other. They've been together their entire life. One of the things I recommend the Guardian do uh, in our puppy classes, we don't let people take siblings to class, the same class. We make you go to different classes. It's inconvenient for you for the short term for one, two, or three months. But if you don't do that, then later on in life, if you lose one of the dogs to cancer or gets hit by a car or something like that, the other dog just is freaks out because doesn't know how to deal with it. So one of the things I'd recommend the Guardian do, they're both well-behaved dogs. Um, he has potential re for resource guarding, but that wouldn't impact that they're both potty trained. So find a friend who likes dogs who doesn't have a dog. You can do it with dogs in their house too, but I'd rather have you find a friend where they don't have a dog and they're gonna be home Friday night. They're not leaving anywhere. So you don't have to leave and worry about the dog getting in trouble. And basically the dog, uh, they, you know, you drop your dog off, it, it hangs out during the afternoon, it spends the night, it wakes up the next, it spends half the day there, then it comes back. So they have time kind of figuring out who they are independent of their sibling. And that can be really beneficial. They're just over a year, so it would have been better if we could have done this sooner, but they're still young enough where it will have an impact. And I would try to do that maybe once or twice a month for the next two, you know, six months or so. So you just get time practice being alone. And you can focus on one dog at a time. It's kind of nice when you have only one dog, or we have two other dogs that live here, but you only have one dog, you really give it your full attention. Um, my very first dog, I thought I was the greatest dog trainer ever, wasn't, he's just a really smart dog and I only had one dog and I was in my 20s. So there was a lot of factors that made it easier for me. So, um, all right, so um, to help uh, these dogs kind of stop getting too worked up, we talked about incorporating some rules. Anything your dog is doing in your presence that you don't specifically disagree with as far as the dogs are concerned, you're really giving two thumbs up to. So if they're playing too rough and we don't say anything, then we're saying we're okay with how, how you're playing. So instead what we do, is um, uh, start incorporating some rules and some structure so the dogs start to see us acting like leaders. Uh, now, um, one of the rules I suggest is not allowing the dogs in the furniture, and usually we have to do x mans We did this, this simulated dog bed here and threw some treats on it. They were lying on it like pretty much right away, and they haven't tried to go back on the couch. I'd recommend giving them the X mats that we talked about and not allowing them on the couch for at least 60 days, if not longer. And then eventually you can start taking one of the X mats away, reposition the other ones, till eventually there's none on there. And they're just used to not getting on the furniture. Like right now you can't see it, but all the couch is covered in uh, multiple blankets. And so it's nice to be able to take those blankets off and enjoy your own furniture. And, uh, and then it becomes a privilege but don't start letting them up on the furniture for a while. You can always go down to their level and hang, you put a pillow here and hang out with them here um, at their level, but for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or status they have. So if we let them sit the same height as us, that's one of the ways that we, they get confused and thinking they have the same rank or they can tell us what to do or ignore what we say. So um, another rule that I have, I love it when dogs do that, um, is uh, I make the dog sit before I let it enter out the door. I go to the door, I say sit once as a command. The dog's gonna sit within three seconds. I walk away, uh, ask Siri or Alexa or whatever for a 60 second timer. After 60 seconds, then I go back to the door, 
Um, and make sure you're sitting when you walk away. Go back to the door and tell them again, sit. And one, two, three. If they don't sit by three, third second this time, I walk away for two minutes, then next time for four minutes, and then for eight minutes. I keep on double the length of time until eventually when I go say sit, the dogs sit down automatically, and then I open the door. And if I go and, open, and I say sit and Sam sits and, and Jack doesn't, I would open the door and let Sam out and not let Jack out. So I'm paying based on performance. I also use a version of what I call coffee for closers. If you've never, don't understand that expression, just go to YouTube and search for coffee for closers. It's a scene from a Glenn, movie called Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, it's awesome. Uh, but basically what it is, is the characters in this scene say, we're running a contest for these leads. First prize is a trip to Y or a Cadillac or something. Second prize is you're fired. Third, set, third prize is a set of state knives. I didn't quite understand that, but what it is is basically saying that I'm gonna reward the top performer. So, so we actually have four dogs that live in the house. Two of them are puppies, hopefully they'll come to our puppy classes. But what I would do is I say, come, have one treat and say, come. And the first dog that comes and sits gets that treat. Whoever comes second, third, or fourth doesn't get anything, unless the second is pretty much the same thing as the first. Then I would split the treat in half and give both dogs a treat. I'm gonna reward the things that I want, not the things that I, not making sure I'm being fair. Well, then the other dog who's last has no motivation to ever try to be first. Other rules I would have is I would not allow the dog to go in the kitchen when we're preparing food. I wouldn't allow the dog to be on the carpet here if anybody's eating food on the uh, couch here. I would have a line going from the corner of the couch to the closet door there and then from the, uh, from the refrigerator to the uh, work island. And that area around the table is off limits when we're cooking. Now you can always go to, uh, going back to the dog training section of my website, um, and if you type in invisible boundary, I walk through how to teach your dog to respect an invisible boundary on its own. Dogs are very instinctive creatures, and so they don't have a lot of practice restraining themselves. So we have to look for opportunities to help them practice. So when we're in the kitchen cooking and they want to go in, that's a wonderful time for them to practice not being allowed to go in the kitchen or in the living room or wherever it is. Um, and so the more that we do that, the more the see dogs uh, and more we enforce rules, the dog sees us acting like a leader, and that helps them see, well, I, I, would, I would want to go take my, my brother's bone, but my guardian's going to disagree with that. But if we don't ever demonstrate that, authority, that leadership by, through our actions, the dogs are going to try to do whatever they want. Um, so um, also another rule is I don't let the dog go out in front of me on uh, out the door, downstairs or upstairs. Um, and so if you're starting to walk down the stairs, the dog race ahead of you, turn around and walk back upstairs and sit down. The dog gets to the bottom of the stairs. Now what's, what are we doing? Where did they go? They come up the stairs. I thought we were going downstairs. Yeah, as soon as you got, took the leadership position, I lost interest. So if the dogs do it a lot, then every time you're walking down that hallway, just take a couple steps down the stairs, even if you're not planning to go down there, they'll run down and you go up and go back to the bathroom. And after a while, they're like, oh, and they'll figure that out. Um, so the more that we enforce rules, the rules should be in place for at least 60 days, if not longer. I used to say 30, but I just read a case study where it talks about, it takes about 66 days to form a new neural pathway or a behavior pattern. So we'd like the dogs to do this. And then after that, the furniture with an invitation and only for good behavior. I also went over how to teach, I uh, showed the guardian how to teach the dogs to leave areas by giving them directional commands. Just touching the dog's nose and then tossing a treat about three feet outside of the zone. When the dog crosses the zone and licks it up, I say the word out. I usually do that with, with twice with each treat. I tear a treat in half, I toss one, gets it out, goes back, toss a second time out and do it from all sorts of different angles off of the area. Same thing with the, the area around the kitchen, uh, same the area around the dining room table, and, and every other doorway in your house. So that way, any room you're in, you can say out, and the dog knows what it knows what you want, it's been trained what you want, and it's been motivated, because I get a treat for leaving the room. Then once I've done all the portals and, and, and areas in the house, then I repeat the process, but this time I would stand outside, and I would throw the treat here, and I might call this media room, because we have a TV. Throw another one in the kitchen and call it kitchen. Throw one in the bedroom and call it bedroom or the name of the person whose room this is. So that way I can say Becca's and the dog knows that means go to bedroom number two. Um, so let me see, um, we, I went over how to teach your dogs to use the dog bed. Message me, I have videos on this as well if you have questions on it, but this shouldn't take too long. Uh, remember for, three day, for about two or three days, twice a day just throw 10 treats in a row there, then leave treats and then uh, and then start giving them treats when they go here on their own. And if they go here on their own and they don't, you don't have any treats, just say the word beach, which is the word we came up for this. And each other dog bed in the house should be uh, a different designation, different name. Uh, for dog beds, make sure they're light cream, light white, or white or uh, light gray, and no pattern on it. And I prefer one that looks like a uh, cushion of a couch. So there's no, you see all the lumps in here? I can toss a treat here, it might hide in the crevice, they wouldn't see it. So I like one that's a little bit flatter. Groupon is the best place to get them, I found. Um, okay, we also went over passive training and petting with a purpose. Passive training is waiting for the dog to organically offer you the behavior. 
So right uh, a minute ago, Jack was putting his chin here. When he did that, I might say ask, because that's one of the things we, we teach dogs to do for people with PTSD is put their chin on a, dog, on a person's knee, and it's a way of saying, hey, you're starting to get out of control. Focus on me and calm down. So you can make that a command by every time your dog does it on its own, pet it and come up with a command word for it. That's what passive training is, just waiting for the dog to do the thing on its own and rewarding it within three seconds and marking it with a single command word. Not good uh, chin, just chin or ass or whatever. And try to come up with funny command words. Dogs can read facial expressions. And so if you say crash when your dogs do this position, people laugh, that motivates the dogs to want to do this. I'd also recommend the guardian come up with a list of the official command words. It should be the same, except for I give dogs a different release word. It should never be the word okay. It's a too commonly used word. I know dogs actually kill because that's a release word. Or a unique word to eat food. And you can also go to Dog on Problems and put structured feeding. And I have a video that explains how you can actually add structure to mealtime. The dogs right now are fed in their kennel, but dogs eat, they place a lot of importance on eating. And so if the guardian starts feeding them one at a time and the guardian's eating something first, remembers feeding them, that person is in a leadership position. Then I feed Sam first, if Sam is behaving better, and then I feed uh, Jack after that. That way Jack wants to go stand next to Sam and try to intimidate Sam and get Sam's food, but Sam sees that we are guarding her so she doesn't have to guard herself. Um, okay, let me see, what else do we over? We over petting with a purpose. Petting with a purpose is the dog comes up and nudges me or asks for my attention by demanding and nudging me, barking at me. If I pet it, then the dog's, I'm validating the dog, yes, you're in charge of me. So when the dog comes and nudges me or jumps up on me or licks me, I tell it, give the dog a counter order, tell it to sit. When it sits, I pet it under its chin, say sit, and only the word sit, and I can pet as much or as little. Um, so um, that way, when the dog stops telling me what to do, it starts asking me for the attention, and they're paying for it with a desired behavior. Remember to use the word, watch word of paycheck. If you come to the room and someone petting without a purpose, we say paycheck, that person stops petting, tells the dog to sit or lay down, and then says, actually, I asked the dog to sit before he came in the room, and I just continued doing it. Um, and you missed it. Um, but don't argue about it, just immediately stop because you know their opportunity to practice again. We also went over some exercises. Another one that you can search for is honey jumping. And that is that we'll show you the technique that I use to teach dogs to teach themselves to stop jumping up on people. This is problematic because when a dog jumps up on a people, who, person who's arriving, that can be a way of dogs claiming them as their property. So instead, if we teach the dog sitting down calmly is the best way to get people's attention, they'll start offering that behavior more and more. So there's a dog named Honey that I worked with, and she's a gold retriever that like looks super dog trying to jump up. Uh, but if you do that and have everybody call or text before they come inside, after a while with enough repetition, the dog just learns if I'm sitting, I'm attractive to humans, if I'm excited, I'm invisible. Um, I also went over how to release the dogs <coughs> um, from their kennels in a calm way. Anything your dog is doing when you pet it or give it attention is what you're rewarding. So teaching it how to be calm before you let it out of the kennel helps achieve a more relaxed demeanor. Um, you can also go to my website and I would just uh, search for kennel training to a down or kennel training to a sit. You should do kennel training to a sit first, <coughs> then you would do kennel training for down. Your water's right there. <laughs> Help yourself. Um, all right, so um, you want to teach the dogs that just because the door opens doesn't mean I have permission to leave the kennel. Um, I, have to, uh, I have to get permission to do that. Um, and that is another opportunity to develop some self-control. Something I did not go over here was uh, teaching dogs uh, to, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, to be calm before the leash. And one of the things the Guardian wanted to work on with these dogs was they pull on the leash and she had some surgery, and so that's obviously problematic. Now, this is a behavior session, so we really didn't go over that, but I can give you one tip that will make the, uh, two tips that make the walks much better. First of all, exercise the dog before you go for a walk, and only walk in them one at a time. Uh, that's not the second tip. The other tip is to make sure they're calm before you leash them up. So let's say that the, wherever the side of the camera is, that as far as you can see, hopefully over here, is where the leash is. I get up and I start walking where the leash is, Sam's like, oh, I know where he's going, he's going to get the leash, and then we're going after excitement of a walk, and they start getting it all worked up. And then we pick up the leash and we validate it. So as soon as the dog starts getting excited or gets in leadership mode, I would stop. So walk to where the leash is and don't tell your dog, we're gonna go for a walk, because that you're just keying them up and throwing gasoline on the fire. Walk towards where the leash is. As soon as they recognize them, they, they will run <coughs> in front of you. As soon as they walk in front of you, turn around and go sit back down. Don't say a word, but what you're saying with enough repetition is when you take the leadership position, I have no interest in going for a walk. It stops me from wanting to walk you. And the best time to do this is when you're not planning on taking for a walk. So people think it's mean, it's called desensitizing. Because they learned that the leash being picked up is, that's classical conditioning. Guaranteed, we're going for excitement of the walk. So you start recreating without the walk afterwards, they get less and less excited. And the dog's energy in the house, 
is the energy they're gonna carry outside of the house. So the first step is just walking to where the leash is. And as soon as they walk in front of you, turn around and walk away. And I would do this with one dog at a time. And eventually you get to where the leash is, and before you reach for it, <coughs> you tell the dog to sit. As soon as the dog sits, then you start reaching. As soon as you start reaching, they're gonna get up and wiggle. You pull your arm back down and say, sit again. If they sit within one or two seconds, then you would go ahead and continue the process. If they didn't sit, I think she wants you to get her something to drink. <laughs> Um, give me a drink. Can you go get her something to drink, buddy? All right. Um, that's all right. This is a home video. Um, so basically, um, <coughs> once, once you, if the dog sits right away, then I continue the process. If it doesn't sit within three seconds, I walk all the way to the couch and sit down, and the whole process starts over. And after a while, you'll be able to reach it. First, at first, you'll reach this far, then it'll be this far, then this far, this far. Then you can actually pick it up. But at any point, the dog gets excited, put it down or drop the leash and tell them to sit. And if they do it within three seconds, we continue. If they don't do it within three seconds, the whole thing stops. And maybe you only have five minutes between, uh, you're just a commercial break between watching Game of Thrones and something else. Well, then you get up and start practicing during that five minutes. You're not planning on taking it for a walk, but the dogs don't know that. And the dog's like, oh, as soon as I get too excited, we, she stops it, loses, she loses interest in walking me. Another opportunity for them to practice self-restraint and teaching them that getting too excited causes me to stop the activity. So we're doing it for the leash. We're doing it when people, we have guests that come in, same principle. So we open the inside door, it's about to be summer or spring, and open the inside door and have the guests just stand out there. The dogs are all excited at the door and we just wait. Don't give them any commands. And as soon as they kind of settle down, reach for the handle, they'll get all excited and pull your hand back. So you might have your guests do this over and over again. I've had several clients during the summertime, they actually put a glass of lemonade out there and a little chair so their guests can be just kind of hang out. So, because it's a very exciting time for dogs. Somebody's about to come in, I can jump mm -hmm. up on them. Mm -hmm. Well now, man, they're kind of teases. Sometimes just come to the door and they knock and they jiggle a handle over and over and they don't even come in at all. Well, that's a great thing for your neighbors to do. And the dogs, it also desensitizes and makes them less excited for that activity. Dogs, just like humans, are more prone to making mistakes when they are overexcited. So if we can get the dogs to learn to be calm and relaxed and balanced, that's gonna help them behave and control themselves better and stop a lot of the unwanted behaviors like these two fighting and going too far and Stam taking it one step too far. Um, let me see, what else do we go over? Um, I think that's pretty much it. Is there anything else? We did the kennel. We did the kennel. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, for passive training, give each dog a command word to eat. The guardian really likes sushi, so that should be one of the dog's words to eat. I'm just kidding, she does not like sushi. <laughs> but your favorite meal, say lasagna, or your name of your favorite restaurant, call it Dario's or whatever it is, and people come over and say Dario's, and your dog runs off to eat. People like laughing, it's funny. But again, it's an opportunity for the dog to practice some self-control. Now, if you do want to work on some loose leash training, I'd like you to work on this stuff for about a month um, in the house. And if you do want to do some loose leash training, let us know. By then I should have a trainer in place and we can have a trainer. We actually teach dogs to walk with a loose leash without a leash and without going for a walk. Because unlike just about every trainer in Omaha, we are positive reinforcement only. If you go on the walk, then it's the excitement of walk. It hard, it's harder for them to control themselves. And most trainers in town use prong colors, which I just don't believe in. And if you do it right, the dog walks next to you because you've taught the dog how to do it without the excitement of a walk and without a leash to pull against. And after a while, they just get used to walking next to you and that just becomes a new behavior pattern. Now, um, they're puppies and so they're gonna be ex excitable. So again, if you do wanna walk them, exercise them. And that's one last thing I guess I talked about that we didn't talk we did talk about is using the stairs. So throw those treats, remember they have a distended stomach, so don't exercise them with a full stomach. And the first time you do it with any of these exercise runs, make sure you exercise them with a full empty stomach and just one dog at a time and exercise that dog until the dog's like, you're crazy, I'm not gonna go down there anymore. What's the sound? What's the, what do you say when you throw? So I throw the treat down the stairs and when it goes down there, I usually say like Mexico or Peru That's or right. a word that means to go south. And dogs can read facial expressions, so I like using those fun command words. And so then basically when the dog comes back up, I give it another treat and say uh, Canada or whatever the command word is. And so this way the dog has, understands, Canada means go up the stairs, Mexico means to go down the stairs. Um, and so uh, one of the ways to exercise would be the stairs. Another one would be chasing the laser. Now some dogs it's not healthy for them to chase the laser. If your dog starts breathing heavy and gets manic, that's not healthy, or frustrated, that's not a good activity for the dog. And they're just chasing it, uh, and within a couple minutes of it going away, they can relax again, that's probably okay. Um, another one would be scent games, S-C-E-N-T. So hiding, putting the treat dog in another room and then hiding five treats and they come around the corner, oh, there's a treat. Hunt or find or search is the command word. 
Um, just Google that. There's a lot of free articles. There's DVDs and stuff you can buy too, but some dogs don't have the best sniffer. Uh, so see if your dogs do, but it's stimulating for them as well as exercise. Um, fetch is a wonderful way to exercise them. Walks are great, but a walk is not, uh, it's more for stimulation and leadership than it's uh, efficient. Remember, they need to exercise um, in small batches throughout the day. Going for a one hour walk is nowhere near as good as going for three 20 minute walks every three or four hours. You might want to start that exercise journal we talked about mm -hmm. for Keepa for about a month and vary the quantities of exercise. Sam might need 44 ups downs on the stairs where uh, Jack might only need 29. And so you want to find out what their maximum number is and then we're going to play around with the values until we come up with one that, you know, uh, a roadmap to success for their daily exercise. Uh, it's usually exercise about every two to four hours. But if you're going to have guests come over, exercise them first. And so that way you deplete that energy. I have a Dalmatian and when he travels with me to Santa Monica, I go to a friend's house and I'm like, man, is he the most chill Dalmatian ever because this is what he does. Well, I put on a harness on my dog and I put on rollerblades and I have the dog pull me from Santa Monica to Venice and then back and do that once or twice. By the time I go to their house, he like sniffs everybody, gets a pet, and he goes and crashes and lays down. And so it's just setting your dog up for success. Uh, now there are two other dogs in the house. Um, I'm talking about really briefly, I probably should have talked in the beginning, so take a note of what the time mark is and so you can have uh, the other people who live in the house with these mm -hmm. dogs. One of them is four months old. He's a, she's a great dog, they're both females. Um, but um, getting a dog around other puppies is invaluable. And your puppy's true personality doesn't set until the nine months. So my recommendation would, and we'll, if you let Becca know that we already did an in-home session, she'll hook up with a deal if you want to take both those dogs into puppy classes. Uh, but I would definitely get the young one in as, as next month and start our, uh, our puppy, our kindergarten class, which for puppies really four months or younger, probably sneak her in. And then uh, she's a pit though. A lot of people are prejudiced against pits. And so we, make, we want to make sure that she's just so well behaved and confident that she's relaxed. Um, and then the other one, a dog um, who is uh, about a six month old is very fearful, of, especially of men. And might have just, and a lot of people think the dog was abused. A lot of times the dog just wasn't exposed to whatever that thing was. And so our puppy classes are great for that because we have other men in the room, but there's a distraction of all these other dogs I want to play with. And she likes playing with other dogs, she loves playing with other dogs. So then we create, we combine, we combine a positive element playing with the other dogs with a negative or something a dog doesn't like being around men. And we just, and as an instructor, we let the men know, hey, if, uh, if the, uh, Bob comes up to you or... Bobby. Bobby, yes, I was right. Uh, Bobby comes up to you, just ignore her. Sometimes if we, if we have a scared, fearful dog, we want to pet the dog. Remember, anything your dog is doing when you pet is what you're going to enhance. So if your dog is scared and you pet it, you will make it slightly more scared every time you pet it. You can touch the dog and lay your hand on it and let you know I'm here with you without amplifying it. But as soon as I start doing this, I'm going to make it work. And this is probably the most common mistake people make with dogs. Um, and so getting uh, her, I, I mean, out of all the dogs, the, the dog I'm most worried about is Bobby. And because at six months old, their dog should not be that fearful. Now, I was able to get her to warm up to me pretty quickly. And right now, it's a very malleable time. But the Guardian only has maybe two months, maybe three months, depending on what her actual age is. And I wouldn't err on it. And the Guardian I was talking to said they had a lot of other things that are going on. And I know those things are important. I would counsel you to cancel those other things and put those on hold for a month or two. I know it's not what you want to do, but I promise you the inconvenience of one or two months of dealing with it and getting it addressed and eliminating it for good is going to, it's going to be like a thousand to one of what you're going to have to deal with for the next 10 to 15 years of that dog's life. You can fix it. You can make the difference so the dog is not fearful, but it's what you're going to do in the next two months and I would not waste a month if it was me. I'm alarmed at seeing how nervous and uh, fearful the dog is. And most dogs are really fearful and the highest risk for biting because when they get back to the corner and they don't know what to do, they just bite. And now the dog gets labeled an, an aggressive or dangerous dog. And it's really just a fearful one that just taking a, a couple puppy classes could take mm -hmm. care of. All right, well, these really high energy dogs, this is Sam <laughs> and, and this is Jack. And this is their roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.